Hello, and welcome to the Learning College. My name is Alex Linder, and I'll, you can find this and everything we record at bnnforum.com, at pieville.net, and at kirksvilletoday.com. Today we're going to do Chapter 5, After the Murder of Alexander II, from The Crucifixion of Russia, Columbus Falco's translation of Alexander Solzhenitsyn's 200 Years Together, A History of the Russians and the Jews. So, page 149 to 181. This will be a slightly longer, so probably about an hour and a half or so, depending on how much there is to say. But this will be, again, chapter 5, after the murder of Alexander II. So, chapter 4 ended with the murder in 1880, I believe it was, or 1881. But in any case, we'd heard about attempts to turn Jews into farmers and attempts to open public education to them. And finally, they got in there, and they got real thick, and they learned Russian, and they began to integrate themselves into Russia. But at the same time, they're promoting Jewish nationalism. So it's ultimately going to come to no good end for Russia, as we know. So now we'll deal with the period after the assassination, the very early 1880s. Chapter 5, After the Murder of Alexander II, page 149. The murder of the Tsar Liberator. Alexander II, shocked the people's consciousness, something the Naradovoltsi intended, but that has been intentionally or unintentionally ignored by historians with the passing of decades. The deaths of heirs or czars of the previous century, Alexei Petrovich, Ivan Antonovich, Peter III, and Paul, were violent, but that was unknown to the people. The murder of March 1st, 1881, caused a panic in minds nationwide. For the common people, and particularly for the peasant masses, it was as if the very foundations of their lives were shaken. Again, as the Naradovoltsi calculated, a Russian word, Naradovoltsi, and remember, Narad means the people, so like, you know, the people's revolutionary whatever. As the Naradovoltsi calculated, this could not help but invite some explosion. And an explosion did occur, but an unpredictable one. Jewish pogroms in Novorossiya and Ukraine. Six weeks after the Regis side, the killing of the king, the pogroms of Jewish shops, institutions, and homes suddenly engulfed a vast territory with tremendous epidemic force. Indeed, it was rather spontaneous. Local people who, for the most different reasons, desired to get even with the Jews, posted incendiary posters and organized basic cadres of pogromists, which were quickly joined by hundreds of volunteers who joined without any exhortation, caught up in the generally wild atmosphere and promise of easy money. In this, there was something spontaneous. However, even the crowds fueled by their alcohol while committing the theft and violence directed their blows in only one direction, in the direction of the Jews the unruliness only stopping at the thresholds of Christian homes. The first pogrom occurred in Elizavetgrad on 15 April. Remember, the, the murder was on March 1st, so on 15 April is the first pogrom, he's calling it Elizavet, Elizavetgrad, or Elizabeth Street or City, <coughs> Elizabeth. Grad, on 15 April, disorder intensified when peasants from the neighboring settlements arrived in order to profit off the goods of the Jews. At first, the military did not act because of uncertainty. Finally, significant cavalry forces succeeded in ending the pogrom. The arrival of fresh forces put an end to the pogrom. There was no rape and murder in this pogrom. According to other sources, one Jew was killed. The pogrom was put down on April 17th by troops who fired into the crowd of thugs. However, from Elizabethgrad, the stirring spread to neighboring settlements. In the majority of cases, the disorders were confined to plundering of taverns and Jews dominating the liquor industry, if not being a monopoly of tavern owners. After a week, a pogrom occurred in the Ananaviski, oozed, district of Odessa, Gubernia province, then in Ananev itself, where it was caused by some petty bourgeois who spread a rumor that the Tsar was killed by Jews and that there was an official order for the massacre of the Jews, but the authorities were hiding this. 
On 23 April, there was a brief pogrom in Kiev, but it was soon stopped with military force. However, on 26 April, a new pogrom broke out, and by the following day it had spread to the Kiev suburbs. This was the largest pogrom in the whole chain of them, but it, as well, ended without human fatalities. Another tome of the same encyclopedia reports the opposite, that several Jews were killed. After Kiev, pogroms took place again in approximately 50 settlements in the Kiev gubernia, during which property of the Jews was subjected to plunder, and in isolated cases, battery occurred. At the end of the same April, a pogrom took place in Konotop, caused mainly by workers and railroad hands, accompanied by one human fatality. In Konotop, there were instances of self-defense from the Jewish side. There was still an echo of the Kiev pogrom in Zmerinka, in several settlements of Chernigov, Gubernia, at the start of May in the small town of Smel, 1L, where it was suppressed with arriving troops the next day, an apparel store was plundered. With echoes in the course of May, at the start of summer, pogroms still broke out in separate areas in Ekaterinoslav and Poltava gubernias, gubernias of Alexandrovsk, Romny, Nezhin, Peryaslavl, and Borisov. Insignificant disorders took place somewhere in Melitopol, Uzd, UEZD. There were cases when peasants immediately compensated Jews for their losses. The pogrom movement in Kishinev, which began on 20th April, was nipped in the bud. There were no pogroms in all of Belarusia, not in that year, nor in the following years, although in Minsk, a panic started among the Jews during rumors about pogroms in the southwestern Krai on account of a completely unexpected occurrence. And next in Odessa. Only Odessa already knew Jewish pogroms in the 19th, in 1821, 1859, and 1871. Those were sporadic events caused mainly by unfriendliness toward Jews on the part of the local Greek population on account of the commercial competition of the Jews and Greeks. In 1871, there was a three-day pogrom of hundreds of Jewish taverns, shops, and homes, but without human fatalities. I.G. Orshansky writes in more detail about this pogrom and states that Jewish property was intentionally destroyed Heaps of watches from the jewelers, they did not steal them, but carried them out to the roadway and smashed them. He agrees that the nerve center of the pogrom was hostility toward the Jews on the part of the Greek merchants, particularly owing to the fact that, after the Crimean War, the Odessa Jews took the grocery trade and colonial commodities from the Greeks. But there was a general dislike toward the Jews on the part of the Christian population of Odessa. This hostility manifested far more consciously and prominently among the intelligent and affluent class than among the common working people. You see, however, that different peoples get along in Odessa. Why then did only Jews arouse general dislike toward themselves, which sometimes turns into severe hatred? One high school teacher explained to his class, quote, The Jews are engaged in incorrect economic relations with the rest of the population incorrect economic relations. That's what they were angry about. Orshansky objects that such an explanation removes the heavier burden of moral responsibility. He sees the same reason in the psychological influence of Russian legislation which singles out the Jews, namely, and only to place restrictions on them. And in the attempt of Jews to break free from restrictions, people see impudence, insatiableness, and grabbing. As a result, in 1881, the Odessa administration, already having experience with pogroms, which other local authorities did not have, immediately put down disorders which were reignited several times, and the masses of thugs were placed in vessels and dragged away from the shore, a highly resourceful method. In contradiction to the pre-revolutionary, the modern encyclopedia writes that this time the pogrom in Odessa continued for three days. Mid-152, pogroms, pogroms blamed on the czarist government, subtitle. The pre-revolutionary encyclopedia recognizes that, quote, the government considered it necessary to decisively put down violent attempts against the Jews. So it was the new Minister of Interior Affairs, Count N.P. Ignatiev, who replaced Loris Melikov in May 1881, 
who firmly suppressed the pogroms, although it was not easy to cope with the rising disturbances of epidemic strength, in view of the complete unexpectedness of events, the extremely small number of Russian police at that time, Russia's police force was then incomparably smaller than the police forces in the Western European states, much less than those of the Soviet Union, and the rare stationing of military garrisons in those areas. Firearms were used for defense of the Jews against pogromists. There was a firing in the crowd and people were shot dead. For example, in Borisov, soldiers shot and killed several peasants. Also in Nezhin, troops stopped a pogrom by opening fire at the crowd of peasant pogromists. Several people were killed and wounded. In Kiev, 1,400 people were arrested. All this together indicates a highly energetic picture of enforcement. But the government acknowledgement its, acknowledged its insufficient preparedness. An official statement said that during the Kiev pogrom, the measures to restrain the crowds were not taken with sufficient timeliness and energy, so they have much... They're not unprepared for this action after the assassination. But what I want to hear is who was assassinating Alexander II. If I didn't know any better, and I'm not saying I do or don't, I've, I've no doubt read it, but I don't remember. Who all were Jews involved with the re revolutionary group that killed Alexander II? And you can guess well that they were. All this together indicates a highly energetic picture of enforcement but the government acknowledged its insufficient preparedness. An official statement said that during the Kiev pogrom, the measures to restrain the crowds were not taken with sufficient timeliness and energy. In a report to His Majesty in June 1881, so two, three months after the assassination, the director of police department, V.K. Plave, P-L-E-H-V-E, -E, named the fact that courts martial treated the accused extremely leniently and in general dealt with the matter quite superficially as, quote, one of the reasons for the development and insufficiently quick suppression of the disorders. Alexander III made a note in the report, this is inexcusable. So they kill Alexander II and they get Alexander III. But forthwith and later, it did not end with accusations that the pogroms were arranged by the government itself. A completely unsubstantiated accusation, much less absurd, since in April 1881, the same liberal reformer, Loris Mel Melikov, headed the government, and all his people were in power in the upper administration. After 1917, a group of researchers, S. Dubnov, G. Krasny Admoni, and S. Lozinski, thoroughly searched for the proof in all the open government archives and only found the opposite, beginning with the fact that Alexander III himself demanded an energetic investigation. So I think what he's saying is the Jews were lying that these pogroms were not spontaneous uprisings. That's why he used spontaneous two or three times, and were in fact directed by Jew-hating governments. But in fact, that was not the case. And when the Soviets took over, that is, the Jewish Revolution succeeded, called the Russian Revolution, they even went to the archive, but they couldn't find anything to support their typically hostile paranoia toward Aryans. In fact, Alexander III himself demanded an energetic investigation. But to utterly ruin Tsar Alexander III's reputation, a nameless someone invented the malicious slander that the Tsar, unknown to anyone, when and under what circumstances, said, quote, and I admit that I myself am happy when they beat Jews, close quote. And this was accepted and printed in emigre liberation brochures. It went into liberal folklore. And even now, after 100 years, it has turned up in publications as historically reliable. And this is a very common pattern of Jewish lying. They lied that when the court, when the jury was deciding the case of Leo Frank, that there were mobs of hate-filled anti-Semites in the street shouting, hang the Jew. And this makes its way into history, and you'll find it cited today. That's exactly what he's saying here in relation to these pogroms, which were, in fact, spontaneous, as Solzhenitsyn is saying. So Jews lie across generations. And even in the short Jewish encyclopedia, quote, the authorities acted in close contact with the arrivals, that is, with outsiders, and it was clear, quote-unquote, to Tolstoy in Yasnaya Polyana that it was, quote, obvious, unquote, all matters were in the hands of authorities. 
if, quote, they wanted one, they could bring on a pogrom. If they didn't want one, there would be no pogrom. He's quoting Tolstoy, a non-Jew, their most famous writer, or one of their most famous writers in the 19th century. The Jews will always use uh, goyim, and who knows, maybe, maybe you know, if they were controlling publishing and only allowing people to write anti-Russian, or write uh, <coughs> who uh, sided with their agenda, as this is the case in the U.S. through pretty much the whole of the 20th century. As a matter of fact, not only was there no incitement on the part of the government, but as Gessen points out, quote, the rise of numerous pogrom brigades in a short time in a vast area, the very character of their actions eliminates the thought of the presence of a single organizational center. So they, even a Jew will admit here and there, they spontaneously rose up in different places over a broad area. They were not organized. And here is another contemporary living testimony from a pretty much unexpected quarter from the Black Repartition Workers leaflet, that is a proclamation to the people in June 1881. The revolutionary leaflet thus described the picture, quote, not only all the governors, but all the other officials, police, troops, priests, Zemstvo, Z-E-M-S-T-V-O, elected district councils, and journalists stood up for the Kulak Jews. The government protects the person and property of the Jews, not the people. So the government is on the side of the Jews, is what the revolutionary leaflet was saying. Threats are announced by the governors, quote, that the perpetrators of the riots will be dealt with according to the full extent of the law. The police look for people who were in the crowd of pogromists, arrested them, dragged them to the police station. Soldiers and Cossacks used the rifle butt and the whip. They beat the people with rifles and whips. Some were prosecuted and locked up in jail or sent to do hard labor. Others were thrashed with birches on the spot by police. Shifting to 155, new subtitle, Exaggeration of Pogrom Violence and Bloodshed. Well, that's something new in Jewish history, exaggerating things done to them or against them. Exaggeration of Pogrom Violence and Bloodshed. Next year, in the spring of 1881, pogroms were renewed, but already not in the same numbers and not in the same scale as in the previous year. The Jews of the city of Balta experienced a particularly heavy pogrom. Riots also occurred in the Baltski Uzd, Uezd, and in still a few others. Balta and Baltski Uzd. However, according to the number of incidents, and according to their character, the riots of 1882 were significantly inferior to the movement of 1881. The destruction of the property of Jews was not so frequent a phenomenon. The pre-revolutionary Jewish encyclopedia reports that at the time of the pogrom in Balta, one Jew was killed. A famous Jewish contemporary wrote, quote, in the pogroms of the 1880s, they robbed unlucky Jews and they beat them, but they did not kill them. Close quote. According to other sources, six or seven deaths were recorded. At the, same, at the time of the 1880 to 1890s, no one remembered mass killings and rapes. However, more than a half century passed, and many publicists, not having the need to delve into the ancient official Russian facts, but then having an extensive and credulous audience, now began to write about massive and premeditated atrocities. So again, they're, uh, as they take power of the Soviet Union, they're inventing fake history to fool the people. For example, we read in Max Raisin's, as it sounds, frequently republished book that the pogroms of 1881 led to the rape of women, murder, and maiming of thousands of men, women, and children. It was later revealed that these riots were inspired and thought out by the very government which had incited the pogromists and hindered the Jews in their self-defense. A G.B. Sliozberg, S-L-I-O-Z-B-E-R-G, so rationally familiar with the workings of the Russian state apparatus, suddenly declared out of country in 1933 that the pogroms of 1881 originated not from below, but from above with Minister Ignatiev, who at that time was still not minister, the old man's memory failed him, and, quote, there was no doubt that threads of the work of the pogrom could be found in the Department of Police. 
thus the experienced jurist affording himself dangerous and ugly groundlessness. Always they say things that are against non-Jews. They lie, and uh, if a lie doesn't work today, maybe it will work tomorrow. So they always see everything as centrally directed the way their whole life is, rather than spontaneous, as a natural reaction to the kind of things they're doing, the uh, <coughs> economic uh, injustice, incorrect relations, as the professor said, is one reason. And yes, here in a serious present-day Jewish journal from a modern Jewish author, we find that, contrary to all the facts, and without bringing in new documents, that in Odessa, in 1881, a three-day pogrom took place, and that in the Balta pogrom, there was, quote, direct participation of soldiers and police. Forty Jews were killed and seriously wounded, 170 lightly wounded, close quote. We just read in the old Jewish encyclopedia, in Balta, one Jew was killed and wounded, several. But in the new Jewish encyclopedia, a century after the events, we read that in Balta, quote, soldiers joined the pogromist, several Jews were killed, hundreds wounded, many women were raped. Pogroms are too savage and horrible a form of reprisal for one to so lightly manipulate casualty figures. There, spattered, basted, is it necessary to begin excavations again? Again, the only point here is Jews lie all the time, continually. History is something for them to make up on the spot. It's not something they have any respect for. It's something they can use. It's just simply fiction. The fiction, they're telling the bogus tale of their past in order to enhance their outcomes in the present. So they'll say whatever works, say anything. Call it history. Call it whatever you want. They don't care. What, they're, what they care about is that it works to fool you. Who is really behind the pogroms? The causes of those first pogroms were persistently examined and discussed by contemporaries. As early as 1872, after the Odessa pogrom, the general governor of the southwestern Cray warned in a report that similar events could happen in his Cray also for, quote, here, the hatred and hostility toward Jews has a historical basis, and only the material dependence of the peasants upon Jews, together with the measures of the administration, currently holds back an indignant explosion of the Russian population against the Jewish tribe. Close quote. The general governor reduced the essence of the matter to economics, as he reckoned and evaluated the business and manufacturing property in Jewish hands in the southwestern Cray, and pointed to the fact that, quote, being increasingly engaged in the recent in the rent of landed estates, the Jews have re-rented and shifted this land to the peasants on very difficult terms. And such a causation received wide recognition in 1881, which was full of pogroms. In the spring of 1881, Loris Melikov also reported to His Majesty, quote, the deep hatred of the local population toward the Jews who enslave it lies at the foundation of the present disorders but ill-intentioned people have undoubtedly exploited this opportunity. And thus, explained the newspapers of the time, examining the causes which provoked the pogroms, only a few organs of the periodical press refer to the tribal and religious hatred. The rest think that the pogrom movement arose on economic grounds. In so doing, some see a protest in the unruly behaviors directed specifically against Jews, or especially against Jews, in light of their economic dominance over the Russian population. Yet others maintain that the mass of the people, in general squeezed economically, look for someone to vent their anger on, and the Jews fit this purpose because of their having little rights. A contemporary of these pogroms, the cited educator V. Portugalov, also said, quote, In the Jewish pogroms of the 1880s, I saw an expression of protest by the peasants and the urban poor against social injustice. Ten years later, U.I. Gessen emphasized that the Jewish population of the southern gubernias in general was able to find sources of livelihood among the Jewish capitalists, while the local peasantry went through extremely difficult times as it did not have enough land, to which the wealthy Jews contributed in part by re-renting the landowners' lands and raising the rental fee beyond the ability of the peasants. Let us not leave out still another witness, known for his impartiality and thoughtfulness, whom no one is accused of being reactionary or of anti-Semitism, Gleb Uspensky, U 
O-S-P-E-N-S-K-I-Y. At the beginning of the 1980s, he wrote, Gleb Uspensky, the Jews were beaten up, namely because they amassed a fortune on other people's needs, other people's work, and did not make bread with their own hands. Under canes and lashes, you see, the people endured the rule of the Tatar and the German, but when the Yid began to harass people for a ruble, they did not take it. But we should note that when soon after the pogroms, a deputation of prominent Jews from the capital, headed by Baron G. Ginsberg, came to Alexander III at the beginning of May 1881, His Majesty confidently estimated that, quote, in the criminal disorders in the south of Russia, the Jews served only as a pretext that this business was the hand of the anarchists. And in those same days, the brother of the Tsar, the Grand Prince Vladimir Alexandrovich, the brother of the Tsar, Grand Prince Vladimir Alexandrovich, announced to the same Ginsburg that, quote, the disorders, as is now known by, by the government, have their sources not exclusively agitation against the Jews, but an aspiration to the work of sedition in general. And the general governor of the southwestern Cray also reported that, quote, the general excited condition of the population is the responsibility of the propagandists. In this, the authorities turned out to be well informed. Such quick statements from them reveal that the authorities did not waste time in investigation, but because of the usual misunderstanding of the Russian administration of that time and its incomprehension of the role of publicity, they did not report the results of the investigation to the public. Sliosberg blames that on the central authority and that it did not even make attempts to vindicate itself of accusations of permitting the pogroms. True, but after all, it accused the government, as we saw, of deliberate instigation and guidance of the pogroms. It is absurd to start with proof that you are not a criminal. Yet not everyone wanted to believe that the incitements came from the revolutionaries. Here, a Jewish memoirist from Minsk recalls, quote, For Jews, Alexander II was not a liberator. He did not do away with the Jewish Pale of Settlement. And although the Jews sincerely mourned his death, they did not say a single bad word against the revolutionaries. They spoke with respect about them, that they were driven by heroism and purity of thought. Close quote. And during the spring and summer pogroms of 1881, they did not in any way believe that the socialists incited toward them. It was all because of the new czar and his government. The government wished for the pogroms. It had to have a scapegoat. And now, when reliable witnesses from the South later indeed confirmed that the socialists engineered them, they continued to believe that it was the fault of the government. However, toward the start of the 20th century, though thorough authors admitted, quote, in the press there is information about the participation of separate members of the Narodnaya Volya, the people's will, in the pogroms. Again, Narod, people, Narodnaya Volya, people's will in the pogroms, but the extent of this participation is still not clear. Judging by the party organ, members of the party consider the pogroms as a sort of revolutionary activity, suggesting that the pogroms were training the people for revolutionary action, that the action which was easiest of all to direct against the Jews now could, in its further development, come down on the nobles and officials. Accordingly, proclamations calling for an attack on the Jews were prepared. Today it is only superficially talked about, like something generally known. Both members of Nerodnia Volya and the Black Reparation were, was prepared to stir rebellion to any fertile soil, including anti-Semitism. From emigration, Tkachev, irrepressible predecessor of Lenin in conspiratorial tactics, welcomed the broadening pogrom movement. Indeed, the Neradovolsti and the weaker Chernoperedelci, members of Black Repartition, I'm not even going to try to pronounce it, so could not wait much longer after the murder of the Tsar, which did not cause the instantaneous mass revolution which had been predicted and expected by them. So they intended to trigger a revolution by killing the Tsar, but it didn't happen. Which, with such a state of general bewilderment of minds after the murder of the Tsar liberator, only a slight push was needed for the reeling minds to re-incline in any direction. So they're upset and confused, and they feel like an earthquake, and they, they decide to attack the Jews, who they don't like for many reasons. 
In that generally unenlightened time, says Solzhenitsyn, that reinclination could probably have happened in different ways. For example, there was then such a popular conception that the Tsar was killed by nobles in revenge for the liberation of the peasants. In Ukraine, anti-Jewish motives existed. Still, it is possible the first movements of spring 1881 anticipated the plot of Narodovoltsy, the plot of the Narodovoltsy, the people's will. It is possible the first movements of spring anticipated the plot of the Narodovoltsy, but right then and there they suggested which way the wind would blow. It went against the Jews. Never lose touch with the people. A movement from the heart of the masses? Of course. Why not use it? Beat the Jews, and later we will get to the landowners. And now the unsuccessful pogroms in Odessa and Ekaterinoslav were most likely exaggerated by the Narodniks. The movement of the pogromists along the railroads and participation of the railroad, railroad workers in the pogroms, everything points to the instigation of pogroms by easily mobile agitators, especially with that particularly inciting rumor that, quote, they are hiding the order of the Tsar, unquote namely to beat the Jews for the murder of his father. So a lot of these people doing the pogroms may believe that rumor that the Tsar wants them to do it. The public prosecutor of the Odessa Judicial Bureau thus emphasized that in perpetrating the Jewish po pogroms, the people were firmly, were completely convinced of the legality of their actions, firmly believing in the existence of a Tsar's decree allowing and even authorizing the destruction of Jewish property. And according to Gessen, quote, the realization that had taken root in the people that the Jews stood outside of the law and that the authorities defending the Jews could not come out against the people had now taken effect, close quote. The Narodniks wanted to use this imaginary notion. A few such revolutionary leaflets are preserved for history. Such a leaflet from 30 August 1881 is signed by the executive committee of the Narodnaya Volya, People's Will, and reads straight away in Ukrainian, colon, quote, Who sees the land, forests, and taverns? The Yid. From whom, Muzhik, peasant, do you have to ask for access to your land, at times hiding tears from Yids? Wherever you look, wherever you ask, the Yids are everywhere. The Yid insults people and cheats them, drinks their blood, and it concludes with the appeal, honest working people, free yourselves. Later in the newspaper, Neradnaya Volya, number six, the People's Will number six, quote, all attention of the defending people is now concentrated hastily and passionately on the merchants, tavern keepers, and money lenders. In a word, on the Jews, on this local bourgeoisie who avariciously rob working people like nowhere else. And after, in a foreword to a leaflet of the Narodnaya Volya, already in 1883, some, quote, corrections, as we turn on to 162. The pogroms began as a nationwide movement, but not against the Jews as Jews, but against Yids, that is, exploiter peoples. In the said leaflet, Zerno, Z-E-R-N-O, the Cherno Peredeltsi, Cherno Peredeltsi, the working class people cannot withstand the Jewish robbery anymore. Wherever one goes, almost everywhere, he runs into the Jew kulak, that is Jew hyphenated kulak. We're used to thinking this kulak is murdered by Jews, but here they're saying Jews as these rich village uh, people, I guess is what it means. The Jew owns the taverns and pubs. The Jew rents land from the landowners and then re-rents it at three times higher to the peasant. He buys wholesale yields of crops and engages in usury, and in the process charges such interest rates that the people outright call them Yiddish rates. This is our blood, said the peasants to the police officials who came to seize the Jewish property back from them. But the same, quote, correction is in Zerno. Quote, and far from all among the Jews are, and far from all among the Jews are wealthy. Not all of them are kulaks. Discard hostility toward differing peoples and differing faiths and unite with them against the common enemy, the czar, the police, the landowners, and the capitalists. However, these corrections came quite late in the day. Such leaflets were later reproduced in Elizavetgrad and other cities of the South, and in the South Russian Workers' Soviet in Kiev, where the pogroms were already over, and the Narodniks tried to stir them up again in 1883, 
hoping to renew and through them to spread the Russian-wide revolution. Of course, the pogrom wave in the South was extensively covered in the contemporary press in the capital. In the reactionary, quote-unquote, Moskoyeva Vedomosti, the writer M. N. Katkov, who always defended the Jews, branded the pogroms as originating with, quote, malicious intriguers who intentionally darken the popular consciousness, forcing people to solve the Jewish question, albeit not by a path of thorough study, but with the help of raised fists. M. N. Katkov, K. A. T. K. O. V. The articles by prominent writers stand out. I. S. Aksakov, A. K. S. A. K. O. V., a steadfast opponent of complete civil liberty for the Jews, attempted to warn the government against two daring steps on this path as early as the end of the 1850s. When a law came out allowing Jews with higher degrees to be employed in the administration, he objected, 1862, 20-plus years before all this happened, saying that the Jews are a bunch of people who completely reject Christian teachings, the Christian ideal and code of morality, and therefore the entire foundation of Russian society, and practice a hostile and antagonistic faith. He was against political emancipation of the Jews, though he did not reject their equalization and purely civil rights in order that the Jewish people could be provided complete freedom in daily life, self-management, development, enlightenment, commerce, and even allowing them to reside in all of Russia. In 1867, he wrote that, economically speaking, quote, we should not talk about emancipation for Jews, but rather about the emancipation of Russians from Jews. There you go. That's how you put it. Again, Jews reversing reality. The reality is the Russians are hostage to Jews. The average Russian is a hostage to Jews. So far from the Jew being oppressed. He noted the blank indifference of the liberal press to the conditions of peasants' life and their needs. So they're just flyover idiots, the same way they look at whites in the U.S. now. They hate them. And now Exakov explained the wave of pogroms in 1881 as a manifestation of the popular anger against, quote, the Jewish yoke over the Russian local people. That's why during the pogroms there was an absence of theft, only the destruction of property, and a kind of simple-hearted conviction in the justice of their actions. And he repeated that it was worth putting the question not about Jews enjoying equal rights with Christians, but about the equal rights of Christians with Jews, about abolishing factual inequality of the Russian population in the face of the Jews. This is I.S. Aksakov, A-K-S-A-K-O-V, saying all this. Basically saying that Jews are inverting the truth, as we know they always do. On the other hand, an article by M.E. Saltikov, Shedrin was full of indignation. The hyphenated name, Saltikov, Shedrin was full of indignation. History has never drawn on its pages a question more difficult, more devoid of humanity, and more tortuous than the Jewish question. There is not a more inhumane and mad legend than that coming out from the dark ravines of the distant past, carrying the mark of disgrace, alienation, and hatred. Whatever the Jew undertakes, he always remains stigmatized. Uh, that's so much mawkish, schmaltzy whining. Shechedrin, <laughs> S-H-C-H-E-D-R-E-N, Shechedrin did not deny that, quote, a significant contingent of moneylenders and exploiters of various kinds are enlisted from the Jews. But he asked, can we really place blame on the whole Jewish tribe on account of one type? Examining the whole discussion of that time, a present-day Jewish author writes, quote, the liberal and, conditionally speaking, progressive press was defending the thugs, and the pre-revolutionary Jewish encyclopedia comes to a similar conclusion. Quote, Yet in the progressive circles, sympathies toward the woes of the Jewish people were not sufficiently displayed. They looked at this catastrophe from the viewpoint of the aggressor, presenting him as a destitute peasant, and completely ignoring the moral sufferings and material situation of the mob Jewish people. And even the radical patriotic notes evaluated it thus, quote, The people rose up against the Jews because they took upon themselves the role of pioneers of capitalism, because they live according to the new truth and confidently draw their own comfortable prosperity from that new source at the expense of the surrounding community. And therefore, quote, it was necessary that the people be protected from the Jew and the Jew from the people. And for this condition of the 
for this, the condition of the peasant needs to be improved. Bottom of 164, new subtitle, Trying to Resolve the Jewish Question. In a letter from a Christian on the Jewish question, published in the Jewish magazine Rasvet Dawn, D. Mordovtsev, a writer sympathetic to the Jews, pessimistically urged the Jews to emigrate to Palestine and America, seeing only in this a solution to the Jewish question in Russia. Jewish social political journalism and the memoirs of this period expressed grievance because the printed publications against the Jews, both from the right and from the revolutionary left, followed immediately after the pogroms. Soon, and all the more energetically because of the pogroms, the government would strengthen restrictive measures against the Jews. Remember, they had been liberalizing until the assassination. Now they're going to go the other way after the pogroms. It is necessary to take note of and understand this insult. It is necessary thoroughly to, under, to examine the position of the government. The general solutions to the problem were being sought in discussions in government and administrative spheres. In a report to His Majesty, N.P. Ignatiev, the new Minister of Internal Affairs, outlined the scope of the problem for the entire previous reign. Quote, Recognizing the harm to the Christian population from the Jewish economic activity, their tribal exclusivity and religious fanaticism, in the last 20 years, the government has tried to blend the Jews with the rest of the population using a whole row of initiatives and has almost made the Jews equal in rights with the native inhabitants. So... They're noticing that, hey, you're liberating the Jews, you're giving them advantages, and they're, they have every benefit over the, over the natives. However, the present anti-Jewish movement, quote, incontrovertibly proves that despite all the efforts of the government, the relations between the Jews and the native population of these regions remain abnormal as in the past. Well, if they remain abnormal, then that's normal. Because of the economic issues, after the easing of civil restrictions, the Jews have not only seized commerce and trade, but they have acquired significant landed property. Moreover, because of their cohesion and solidarity, they have, with few exceptions, directed all their efforts not toward the increase of the productive strength of the state, but primarily toward the exploitation of the poorest classes of the surrounding population. And now, after we have crushed the disorders and defended the Jews from violence, quote, it seems just and urgent to adopt no less, no less energetic measures for the elimination of these abnormal conditions between the native inhabitants and the Jews and to protect the population from that harmful activity of the Jews. So more people are saying, hey, you need to protect the Christians and the Russians from the Jews, not vice versa. In accordance with that, in November 1881, governmental commissions comprised of representatives of all social strata and groups, including Jews, were established in 15 gubernias of the Jewish Pale of Settlement and also in Kharkov gubernia. The commission sought to examine the Jewish question and propose their ideas on its resolution. It was expected that the commissions would provide answers on many factual questions such as some asterisks here for points. One, in general, which aspects of Jewish economic activity are most harmful for the way of life of the native population in the region? Which difficulties hinder the enforcement of laws regulating the purchase and rental of land, trade in spirits, and usury by Jews? Renting land, booze, usury, and landlording, essentially. Which changes are necessary to eliminate evasion of these laws by Jews? Which legislative and administrative measures in general are necessary to negate the harmful influence of the Jews in various kinds of economic activity? The liberal Palinskaya Interministerial High Commission established two years later for the revision of laws on Jews, the revision of laws on the Jews, noted that, quote, the harm from the Jews, their bad qualities and traits, were somewhat recognized a priori in the, pro, in the program that was given to the provincial commissions. On to 167, yet many administrators in those commissions were pretty much liberal 
as they were brought up in the stormy epoch of Tsar Alexander II's reforms, and moreover public delegates participated also, and Ignatiev's ministry received rather inconsistent answers. Several commissions were in favor of abolishing the Jewish Pale of Settlement. Individual members of the commissions, and they were not few, declared that the only just solution to the Jewish question was the general repeal of all restrictions. On the other hand, the Vilnius Commission stated that because of the mistakenly understood notion of universal human equality wrongly applied to Judaism to the detriment of the native people, the Vilnius Commission stating this, the mistakenly understood notion of universal human equality, human equality, mistakenly understood notion of human equality, universal human equality, the Vilnius Commission stated that because of the mistakenly understood notion of universal human equality wrongly applied to Judaism to the detriment of the native people, because of that, the Jews managed to seize economic supremacy. That, quote, the Jewish law permits them to profit from any weakness and gullibility of the Gentile. Let the Jews renounce their seclusion and their isolation. Let them reveal the secrets of their social organization, allowing light where only darkness appeared to outsiders. Hey, tell us what you're all about, Mr. Jew. And only then can one think about opening new spheres of activity to the Jews, without fear that Jews wish to use the benefits of the nation or any new rights they get, while not being members of the nation and not taking upon themselves a share of the national burden, for instance, avoiding the draft. Again, in, in my view of this is that no one, none, none of the Aryans involved, none of the Russians involved is stepping back and thinking, we're playing with something that is potentially extremely destructive. We, it's not just giving them more and more rights. At some point, they're going to absolutely take over, and then you're going to be in a world of pain. And that is exactly what did, in fact, happen. It seems to me that if you were going to make a mistake, the mistake you would have made would have been simply driving them out of your territory, not giving them equal rights and hoping that the problem goes away. <laughs> and actually the rational thing would have to do would have been to round them up and simply exterminate them. You see, they have rights within, even if their rights are restricted, they have rights within our society and they're given a moral stature by Christianity they invented and spread. But, contrarily, we, a Goyim or Aryan, has no rights in Jews. They have the right to use us however they want, up to and including raping and murdering us. Even the best of the Goyim should be killed. Where's the gun to bring to that gunfight? It's not talking about how many rights they have and whether they should be allowed to continue to go on exploiting the local population. This is insanity. It, it, it shows a, a race that is not able to think clearly enough to continue to survive. Regarding residents in the villages and hamlets, the commissions found it necessary to restrict the rights of the Jews, forbid them to live there altogether, or make it conditional upon the agreement of the village communities. Some commissions recommended completely depriving the Jews of the right to possess real estate outside of the cities and small towns, and others proposed establishing restrictions. The commission showed the most unanimity in prohibiting any Jewish monopoly on alcohol sales in villages. Flipping to 168. The ministry gathered the opinions of the governors, and with rare exceptions, comments from the regional authorities were not favorable to the Jews. Quote, To protect the Christian population from so haughty a tribe as the Jews, one can never expect the Jewish tribe to dedicate its talents to the benefit of the homeland. Talmudic morals do not place any obstacles before the Jews if it is a question of making money at the expense of someone outside of the tribe. Yet the Kharkov general governor did not consider it possible to take restrictive measures against the whole Jewish population without distinguishing the lawful from the guilty. Again, the mistake, you can't treat Jews as individuals. They're not individuals. They are a tribe. They are a monolith. He proposed to expand the right of movement for Jews and spread enlightenment among them. 
the soft liberal approach that by through education and social reform, we're going to turn them into the kind of person we want rather than acknowledge they're the type of thing they are. That same autumn, by Ignatiev's initiative, a special committee on the Jews was established, the ninth by count already, with three permanent members, two of them professors, the task of analyzing the materials of the provincial commissions and in order to draft a legislative bill. The previous, quote, Commission for the Organization of the Life of the Jews, that is the Eighth Committee on Jews, which existed since 1872, was soon abolished due to the gap between its original purpose and the present state of the Jewish question after the pogroms and the assassination. The new committee, the Ninth, proceeded with the conviction that the goal of integrating the Jews with the rest of the population toward which the government had striven for the last 25 years, basically from the 1850s to 1880, had turned out to be unattainable. Okay, we can't integrate them. Well, what do we do? What, do you, what do you say? Let's put together the Ninth Commission and see. Therefore, quote, the difficulty of resolving the complicated Jewish question compels us to turn for the instruction of the old times, when various novelties did not yet penetrate either our own or foreign legislation, and did not bring with them the regrettable consequences which usually appear upon adoption of new things that are contrary to the national spirit of the country. From time immemorial, the Jews were considered aliens and should be considered as such. Guess and comments. The reactionary could not go further. Well, why not? He could say they should simply be rounded up and exterminated. And if you were so concerned about the national foundations, then why didn't you worry about genu <laughs> genuine emancipation of the peasantry during the past 20 years? And it was also true that Tsar Alexander II's emancipation of the peasants proceeded in a confused, unwholesome, and corrupt environment. However, in governmental circles, there were still people who did not consider it possible, in general, to change the policy of the preceding reign, and they were in important posts and strong. And some ministers opposed Ignatiev's proposals. Seeing resistance, he divided the proposed measures into fundamental, for which passing in the regular way required moving through the government and the state council, and provisional, fundamental and provisional, which could be by law adopted through an accelerated and simplified process. To convince the rural population that the government would protect them from exploitation by Jews, the permanent residence of Jews outside of their towns and shtetls, since the government was powerless to protect them from pogroms in the scattered villages, and the buying and renting of real estate there, and also trading in spirits, was prohibited. Regarding the Jews already living there, it granted to the rural communities the right to evict the Jews from the villages based on a verdict of the village meeting. But other ministers, particularly the Minister of Finance, N.K. Bung, B-U-N-G-E, possibly a German, and the Minister of Justice, D.N. Nabokov, did not let Ignatiev implement these measures. They rejected the bill, claiming that it was impossible to adopt such extensive prohibitive measures without debating them within the usual legislative process. As we turn on to page 170. So much for the boundless and malicious arbitrariness of the Russian autocracy under the Tsars. Ignatiev's fundamental measures did not pass, and the provisional ones passed only in a greatly truncated form. Rejected were the provisions to evict the Jews already living in the villages, to forbid their trade in alcohol, and their renting and buying land in villages. And only because of the fear that the pogroms might happen again around Easter of 1882, a temporary measure until passing of comprehensive legislation about the Jews was passed, which again prohibited the Jews henceforth to take residence and enter into ownership or make use of real estate property outside of their towns and shtetls, that is, in the villages, and also forbade them to trade on Sundays and Christian holidays. Concerning the Jewish ownership of local real estate, the government acted to suspend temporarily the completion of sales and purchase agreements and loans in the name of the Jews, the notarization of real estate rental agreements, and the proxy management and disposal of property by them. I guess they're saying, well, maybe we can just lock them up in the cities and make them a trader class and keep them, we'll keep from uh, agitating the peasants. This mere relic of Ignatiev's proposed measures was approved on 3 May 1882 under the title of 
temporary, capital T, regulations, known as the May Regulations. Ignatiev himself went into retirement after a month. His Committee on the Jews ceased its brief existence, the Ninth, Com Ninth Commission on this stuff, and a new Minister of Internal Affairs, Count D.A. Tolstoy, issued a stern directive against possible new pogroms, placing full responsibility on the provincial authorities for the timely prevention of disorders. Thus, according to the temporary regulations of 1882, the Jews who had settled in rural regions before the 3rd of May were not evicted, and their economic activity there was essentially unrestricted. Moreover, these regulations only applied to the gubernias, G-U-B-E-R-N-I-Y-A-S. These regulations only applied to the gubernias of permanent Jewish settlement, not to the gubernias of the Russian interior. These restrictions did not extend to doctors, attorneys, and engineers, i.e. individuals with the right of universal residence according to educational requirements. These restrictions also did not affect any existing Jewish colonies still engaged in agriculture, and there was still a considerable and later growing list of rural settlements, according to which, in exception to the temporary regulations, capital TR, Jews were permitted to settle. After issuance of the regulations, inquiries began flowing from the regions, and Senate explanations were issued in response. For example, Journeys through rural regions, temporary stops, and even more temporary stays of individuals without the right of permanent residence were not pro prohibited by the law of 3 May 1882, again the May regulations or the temporary regulations, that only the rent of real estates and agrarian lands was prohibited, while rent of all other types of real estate property, such as distillation plants, buildings for trade and industry, and living quarters was not prohibited. Also, quote, the Senate deems permissible the notarization of lumbering agreements with the Jews, even if the clearing of a forest was scheduled for a prolonged period, and even if the buyer of the forest was allowed to use of the underbrush land, quote. And finally, that violations of the law of 3rd May would not be subjected to criminal prosecution. Says Solzhenitsyn, it is necessary to recognize these Senate clarifications as mitigating, and in many respects, good-natured. In the 1880s, the Senate wrestled with the arbitrary interpretation of the laws. However, the regulations forbidding the Jews to settle outside the towns and shtetls and or to own real estate, and the extremely restricted permission for alcohol distillation business by Jews was very significant. It was exactly this measure to restrict the Jews in the rural wine trade, first proposed as early as 1804, it stirred universal indignation at the, quote, extraordinary severity of the May regulations, unquote, even though it was only implemented, and incompletely at that, in 1882. The government stood before a difficult choice. To expand the wine industry in the face of peasant proneness to drunkenness, and thus to deepen the peasant poverty, or to restrict the free growth of this trade by allowing Jews already living in the villages to remain while stopping others from coming. And that choice, restriction, was deemed cruel. Yet how many Jews lived in rural regions in 1882? We have already come across post-revolutionary estimates from one state archive, from the state archives, one-third of the entire Jewish population of the Pale lived in villages, another third lived in shtetls, 29% lived in mid-sized cities, and 5% in the major cities. So the regulations now prevented the, quote, village third from further growth? Today, these May regulations are portrayed as a decisive and irrevocably repressive boundary of Russian history. A Jewish author writes, quote, This was the first push toward emigration, first internal migration, then massive overseas migration. The first cause of Jewish emigration was the Ignatiev temporary regulations, which violently threw around one million Jews out of the hamlets and villages and into the towns and shtetls of the Jewish pale. Wait a second, says Solzhenitsyn. How did they throw out the Jews out and an entire million at that? Didn't they apparently only prevent new arrivals? 
No, no, it was already picked up and sent rolling that from 1882, the Jews were not only forbidden to live in the villages everywhere, but in all the cities too, except in the 13 gubernernas, that is inside the pale, that they were moved back to the shtetls of the pale. That is why the mass immigration from Jews began, from Russia began. So the typical Jews, A, they're lying. They're always lying. What are they lying about? Oh, they're lying about where they were forced to live and move and claiming that they're leaving because they're being harassed and persecuted, when in fact they might have at most said, okay, we can't have any more Jews moving to these little villages. So comparatively minor restrictions are treated as atrocities, as is the usual Jewish way. 173. Well, let us set the record straight. The first time the idea about Jewish emigration from Russia to America was voiced was as early as in 1869 at the conference of the Alliance of the World Jewish Union, with the thought that the first two settled there with the help of the Alliance and local Jews would become a magnet for their Russian co-religionists. Moreover, the beginning of the emigration of Jews from Russia dates back to the mid-19th century and gained significant momentum after the pogroms of 1881. But only since the mid-1890s does emigration become a major phenomenon of Jewish economic life, assuming a massive scale. Note that it says economic life, not political life. From a global viewpoint, Jewish immigration into the United States in the 19th century was part of an enormous century-long and worldwide historical process. There were three successive waves of Jewish emigration to America. First, the Spanish-Portuguese Sephardic wave, that was more or less the Caribbean and South America. Then the German wave from Germany and Austria-Hungary, and then only then from Eastern Europe and Russia. Well, yes, but the big numbers came after 1880 from Eastern Europe, the Ashkenazic and Russia. For reasons not addressed here, a major historical movement of Jewish emigration to the U.S. took place in the 19th century, and not only from Russia. Now, the Jews in the U.S. were comparatively few in number, and they were mostly German until after 1880. They became mostly Russian, and they were much larger in number and volume. In light of the very lengthy Jewish history, it is difficult to overestimate the significance of this emigration. From the Russian Empire, a river of Jewish emigration went from all the gubernias that made up the Jewish Pale of Settlement, but Poland, Lithuania, and Belarusia gave the greatest number of emigrants, meaning they did not come from Ukraine, which was just experiencing the pogroms. The reason for this was the emigration was the same throughout. Overcrowding, which created inter-Jewish economic competition. They need more sucker goyim to live among them practice their tricks. Moreover, relying on Russian state statistics, V. Telnikov turns our attention to the last two decades of the 19th century. Just after the pogroms of 1881-82, comparing the resettlement of Jews from the Western Cray, where there were no pogroms, to the Southwest, where they were, the latter was numerically not less and was possibly more than the Jewish departure out of Russia. In addition, in 1880, according to official data, 34,000 Jews lived in the internal gubernias, while 17 years later, according to the census of 1897, there were already 315,000, a nine-fold increase. He's saying people were moving where the pogroms were, so using that as an excuse is BS. In fact, it went up tenfold. Of course, the pogroms from 1881-82 caused a shock, but was it really a shock for the whole of Ukraine? For example, Sliosberg writes, quote, The 1881 pogroms did not alarm the Jews in Poltava, and soon they forgot about them. Close quote. In the 1880s in Poltava, quote, The Jewish youth did not know about the existence of the Jewish question, and in general did not feel isolated from the Russian youth. Close quote. The pogroms of 1881-82, in their complete suddenness, could have seemed unrepeatable, and the unchanging Jewish economic pull was prevailing. Go, settle hither, where fewer Jews live. But undoubtedly and inarguably, a decisive turn of progressive and educated Jewry, away from the hopes of a complete integration with the nation of Russia and the Russian population, began in 1881. So after the assassination and the, the uh, pogroms. G. Aronson even concluded hastily that the 1881 Odessa pogrom shattered the illusions of assimilation. 
No, it wasn't that way yet. But if, for example, we follow the biographies of prominent and educated Russian Jews, then around 1881-82, we will note in many of them, says Solzhenitsyn, a drastic change in their attitudes toward Russia and about the possibilities of complete assimilation. By then it was already clear and not contested that the pogrom wave was indubitably spontaneous. That's the main point Solzhenitsyn is trying to establish. These were not directed by the Tsar. They were not directed by any centralized power or any part of the government. They were, in fact, spontaneous uprisings without any evidence for the complicity of the authorities. As we move on to, across to 175, on the contrary, the involvement of the revolutionary Narodniks was proven. However, the Jews did not forgive the Russian government for these pogroms, and never have since. And although the pogroms originated mainly with the Ukrainian population, the Russians have not been forgiven, and the pogroms have always been tied with the name of Russia. The pogroms of the 1880s sobered many of the advocates of assimilation, but not all. The idea of assimilation still remained alive. And here, other Jewish publicists moved to the other extreme. In general, it was impossible for Jews to live among other peoples, for they will always be looked upon as alien. And the Palestinian movement began to grow quickly. It was under the influence of the 1881 pogroms that the Odessa doctor Lev Pinsker published his brochure, Auto Emancipation, quote, the appeal of a Russian Jew to his fellow tribesmen, or colon, the appeal of a Russian Jew to his fellow tribesmen in Berlin in 1882 and anonymously. It made a huge impression on Russian and West European Jewry. It was an appeal about the ineradicable foreignness of the Jew in the eyes of surrounding peoples. We will discuss this further in Chapter 7, so reaction to the, a counter-reaction to the Enlightenment and the making this civil, granting of civil rights across Western Europe and in Russia saying, nah, we'll never mix with these people. We need to get our own land. Preceding Zionism and Herzl. P. Axelrod claims that it was then that radical Jewish youths discovered that Russian society would not accept them as their own, and thus they began to deport, depart from the revolutionary movement. However, this assertion appears to be too far-fetched, in the revolutionary circles, except the Narodnaya Volya, the people's will, they did always think of the Jews as their own. However, despite the cooling of attitudes of the Jewish intelligentsia toward assimilation, the government, as a result of inertia from Alexander II's reign, for a while maintained a sympathetic attitude toward the Jewish problem and did not fully replace it by a harshly restrictive approach. After the year-long ministerial activities of Count Ignatiev, who experienced such persistent opposition on the Jewish question from liberal forces in the upper governmental spheres, an imperial high commission for the revision of the active laws about the Jews in the empire was established in the beginning of 1883, or as it was named for its chairman, Count Palin, P-A-L-E-N, the Palinskaya Commission, so that by then it became the tenth such Jewish commission, committee. Kalinskaya Commission. It consisted of 15 to 20 individuals from the upper administration, members of ministerial councils, department directors. Some were members of great families such as Bestuzhev, Ryuman, Golitsyn, Speransky, and it also included seven Jewish experts, influential financiers including Baron Gorazzi Ginsburg and Samuel Polyakov, and prominent public figures such as Yehuda Galpern, physiologist and publicist N. Boxed. It is highly likely that the favorable attitude of the majority of the members of the commission toward resolution of the Jewish question was caused, to a certain degree, by the influence of Baxed, B-A-K-S-T, and Rabbi A. Drabkin. In large part, it was these Jewish experts who prepared the materials for the commission's consideration. Again, we're down to the 10th commission now. The majority of the Palinskaya Commission, the 10th Commission, expressed the conviction that, quote, the final goal of legislation concerning the Jews should be nothing other than its abolition. And, quote, there is only one outcome and only one path, the path of liberation and unification of the Jews 
with the whole population under the protection of the same laws. We're going to make the gosh darn religion not matter and just fold them into us, even though everything that they say is extremely injurious to us and antithetical to mixing with any other people. Indeed, rarely in Russian legislation did such complicated and contradictory laws pile up as the laws about Jews that accumulated over the decades. 626 statutes by 1885. Now, you know, when it's that complicated, you need to make it simple. And the simple thing is get these assholes out of our country if you're not going to simply put them underground. And they were still at it later in the Senate. They constantly researched and interpreted their wording. So we move on to 177, a few more pages here. And even if the Jews did not perform their duties as citizens in equal measure with others, nevertheless, it was impossible to deprive the Jew of those fundamentals on which his existence was based, his equal rights as a subject. Agreeing that several aspects of internal Jewish life required reforming and that certain Jewish activities constituted exploitation of the surrounding population, the majority of the commission condemned the system of repressive and exclusionary measures. The commission set as the legislative goal to equalize the rights of the Jews with those of all other subjects, although it recommended the utmost caution and gradualness with this. Paradoxically, however, the commission only succeeded in carrying out a partial mitigation of the restrictive laws. Its greatest efforts were directed of the temporary regulations in, of 18, 1882, particularly in regard to the renting of land by Jews. The commission made the argument as if in the defense of the landowners, not the Jews, prohibiting Jews to rent manorial lands not only impedes the development of agriculture, but also leads to a situation when certain types of agriculture remain in complete idleness in the Western Cray to the loss of the landowners as there is nobody to whom they could lease them. However, the Minister of Interior Affairs, D.A. Tolstoy, agreed with the minority of the commission the prohibition against new land leasing transactions would not be repealed. The Palinskaya Commission lasted for five years until 1888, and in its work, the liberal majority always clashed with the conservative minority. From the beginning, Count Tolstoy certainly had no intention to revise the laws to increase the repressive measures, and the five-year existence of the Palinskaya Commission, the Tenth Commission, confirms this. At that moment, His Majesty also did not wish to influence the decisions of his government on the matter of the increase of repressions against Jews. Ascending to the throne at such a dramatic moment, Alexander III did not hasten either to replace liberal officials nor to choose a harsh political course. For a long time, he carefully examined things. In the course of the entire reign of Alexander III, the question about a general revision of the legislation about the Jews remained open. But by 1886-87, His Majesty's view already leaned toward hardening of the partial restrictions on the Jews, and so the work of the Commission did not produce any viable result. One of the first motivations for stricter control or more constraint of the Jews than during his father's reign was the constant shortfall of Jewish conscripts for military service. It was particularly noticeable when compared to the conscription of Christians. According to the Charter of 1874, which abolished recruiting, compulsory military service was now laid on all citizens without any difference in social standing but with the stipulation that those unfit for service would be replaced, Christians with Christians and Jews with Jews. In the case of Jews, there were difficulties in the implementation of that rule, as there was both straightforward emigration of conscripts and their evasion of service, which all benefited from great confusion and negligence in the official records on Jewish population, in the keeping of vital statistics, in the reliability of information about the family situation and exact place of rev residence of conscripts. So yeah, they have universal conscription, but the Jews are still doing everything they can to avoid, avoid it. The tradition of all these uncertainties stretched back to the times of the Cajals, a 
which was outlawed in 1844. That's the Jewish self-organization, as we've heard many times, a theocratic organizational structure that originated in ancient Israelite society and was consciously maintained for easing the tax burden. In 1883 and 84, there were many occasions when Jewish recruits, contrary to the law, were arrested simply on suspicion that they might disappear. This method was first applied to Christian recruits, but sporadically. In some places, they began to demand photographs from the Jewish recruits, a very unusual requirement for that time. And in 1886, a highly constraining law was issued, including several measures for providing for regular, mili regular fulfillment of military conscription by Jews, which established a 300-ruble fine from the relatives of each Jew who evaded military call-up. From 1887, they stopped allowing Jews to apply for the examination for officer rank. Educated soldiers had privileges in choosing military specialty in the course of service. During the reign of Alexander II, the Jews could serve in the officers' ranks, but officer positions in the military medicine always remained open to Jews. Yet if we consider that in the same period, up to 20 million other aliens of the empire were completely freed from compulsory military service, then wouldn't it be better to free the Jews of it altogether, thus offsetting their other constraints with such a privilege? Or was it the legacy of the idea of Nicholas I continuing here to graft the Jews into Russian society through military service? Make them farmers, make them uh, fighters, make them warriors. No? To occupy the idol? At the same time, Jews on the whole flocked into institutions of learning. From 1876 to 1883, the number of Jews in gymnasiums and the gymnasium preparatory schools, that's a German word for high school, gymnasium, taken from the Greek, ancient Greeks, almost doubled number in gymnasiums and prep schools. And from 1878 to 1886, for an eight-year period, the number of Jewish students in the universities increased six times and reached 14.5%. And again, they're like 3% of the population. By the end of the reign of Alexander II, they were receiving alarming complaints from the regional authorities about this. Thus, in 1878, the governor of the Minsk gubernia reported that, quote, being wealthier, the Jews can bring up their children better than the Russians. The material condition of the Jewish peoples is better than that of the Christians, and therefore, in order that the Jewish ele element does not overwhelm the remaining population, it is necessary to introduce a quota system for the admission of Jews into secondary schools. Next, after disturbances in several southern gymnasiums in 1880, the trustee of the Odessa School District publicly came out with a similar idea, and again, in the U.S., they started doing this in 1900-1910 period at the Ivy Leagues. And in 1883 and 1885, two successive Novo Rossiysk Odessa general governors stated that an overfilling of learning institutions with Jews was taking place there, and it is either necessary to limit the number of Jews in the gymnasiums and gymnasium preparatory schools to 15% of the general number of pupils, or to a fairer norm, equal to the proportion of the Jewish population in the whole. By 1881, Jews made up 75% of the general number of pupils in several gymnasiums of the Odessa district. In 1886, a report was made by the governor of Kharkov, Gubernia, complaining about the influx of Jews to the common schools. In all these instances, the ministers did not deem it possible to adopt general restrictive solutions and only directed the reports for the consideration to the Palinskaya Commission, where they did not receive support. From the 1870s onward, students became primary participants in the revolutionary excitement. After the assassination of Alexander II, the general intention to put down the revolutionary movement could not avoid student revolutionary nests, and the senior classes of the gymnasiums were already supplying them. Within the government, there arose the alarming connection that, together with the increase of Jews among the students, the participation of students in the revolutionary movements notably increased. Among the higher institutions of learning, the Medical Surgical Academy, later the Military Medical Academy, was particularly revolutionized. Jews were very eager to enter it, and the names of Jewish students of this academy began already appearing in the court trials of the 1870s. And so the first special restrictive measure of 1882 
restricted Jewish admissions to the Military Medical Academy, hyphenated, to an upper limit of 5%. So Jews are going into all these educational things and they're becoming hotbeds of revolutionary sentiment and Jews, of course, are among the leaders of this. In 1883, a similar order followed with respect to the Mining Institute and in 1884, a similar quota was established at the Institute of Communications. In 1885, the admission of Jews to the Kharkov Technological Institute was limited to 10%. And in 1886, their admission to the Kharkov Veterinary Institute was completely discontinued, since the city of Kharkov was always a center of political agitation, and the residents of Jews there in more or less significant numbers is generally undesirable and even dangerous. Thus they thought or sought to weaken the crescendo of revolutionary waves. And now that's the end of what we're going to do today. And we're, we're starting to see, you know, the, the communist revolution is going to come out of this matrix of a lot more Jews getting education and being in cities and talking to each other and the ideas of Karl Marx and the new technology for transportation and communication, allowing them to network and, and build up these organizations more easily, and their history of radicalism and the radicalization of the population through the assassinating Alexander II and such. And so this was also the end of chapter five, but also the end of volume one, and the whole thing is divided into two volumes. And next we'll deal with volume two, the Jews in the Soviet Union. But anyway, that will do it for today. I've been Alex Linder reading to you out of Columbus Falco's translation, which he calls The Crucifixion of Russia, a new English translation of Alexander Solzhenitsyn's 200 Years Together, A History of the Russians and the Jew. This was recording number, oh my gosh, it's so easy to forget the recording number. I believe this was recording number eight, yes. And as always, you find it at vnnforum.com, pieville.net, and at kirksvilletoday.com. Thanks for being with me, and I'll be with you again real, real soon.